welcome everyone into the uh, Mid Atlantic PGA uh, online education series. keeps uh, keeps trucking here, and uh, we were looking forward to this one. Uh, today we're uh, really happy to have uh, Sean Webb and Mike Granada with Athletic Motion Golf, uh, and our three time and reigning uh, Teacher of the Year of our section, Bernie Najar. Um, guys, thanks for doing this. Uh, Bernie's going to run the show with Sean and Mike for us today, and um, we're really looking forward to some great stuff today. If you have questions uh, for them, what we're going to do is keep Mike's muted. Please just type it into the chat. Sean English and I will be monitoring that and shoving those questions over to Bernie to filter to uh, Sean and Mike for all their great info. So we're really looking forward to it. Uh, Bernie, all yours, buddy. All right. Thanks so much, Mark and Sean. I don't know why I'm echoing there. Hopefully uh, we can clean that up. But in any event, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We've got two of the most influential online purveyors of golf instruction here with us today, Mike Granato and Sean Webb from Athletic Motion Golf. And both, uh, both of these fine professionals work extremely hard on producing products online for golfers of all abilities. We're going to get into the business of what they do and talk a little bit about their career paths. So um, Mike and Sean, if you're ready to go, I'd love you to join in here. We're here. Glad, glad to be here. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. And just uh, some numbers for everyone that I think is really worth discussing and, and maybe um, Mike and Sean can talk about this. You know, your social uh, following right now on Instagram, 109,000 followers. Very impressive. On YouTube, you have over 30 million views and a large number of followers. And obviously, you two have put together a great product that continues to grow. If you could talk to us a little bit about your journey together, when it started, and how you see things going from this point forward. Yeah, is uh, Sean on? You there, Sean? Lost him. Okay. Yeah, I'll pick. Yeah, that I'm up. here. Can you hear? Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, there you I, are. I had myself. Yeah. Yeah. You want to start? Go ahead. Yeah. So Sean and I met. I guess it's been close to probably close to ten years, maybe eleven years ago. Now we actually met in Long Island. We were both up there going to see. Uh, man about a horse we're actually going up there to buy uh 3d systems and we had never met we got to hang it out while we were there and kind of hit off a friendship and then a couple years later we were in dallas around christmas time uh, at a swing cattle deal swing catalyst deal down there and a the dinner one night you know it's where a lot of ideas are exchanged you know kind of the after hours type stuff and we both kind of ha were kicking around the idea of doing some online lessons. And this was back in 2015. And, you know, neither of us have ever done it. And we just figured, okay, let's, let's try to do something together. We'll partner up. That way, if we totally mess it up, it only cost us half, half of the lesson um, to learn how to do it. And uh, that's kind of where we hatched the idea. And I think Sean actually came up the name Athletic Motion Golf. We kicked around a few names. And uh, as, as things are now, it kind of comes down to what um, uh, URLs are available. And Athletic Motion Golf was available, and it wound up being a, a good fit for how we see the golf swing. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime I mean, in there for a second, too. Um, sorry, Bernie, just to fill no, that in a little it's all bit. Good. And we both come from an athletic background. Like I played all the sports, baseball, basketball, golf growing up, and Mike was a super high-level basketball player. He played D1 college basketball. So we wanted to – have something in the name that encompassed our backgrounds because we have a lot of people that come for us, uh, come to us for lessons, as we all know, that have athletic backgrounds. And we want to kind of incorporate that into the name and how we kind of see the swing and um, go about helping golfers. Well, that's great insights there, guys. And obviously, you know, you've, you've gone from different parts of the country to now you've uh, managed to set up and you're, I think you've got a grand opening coming up in Orlando soon. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So um, mid March, we're going to open an indoor facility down here with eight track man bays with all the tech and um, it's 5,000 square feet. So that should be open in a few weeks. That's fantastic. Well, um, in terms of your journey, you know, obviously uh, so many of us are curious about 
how do you come up with the content that you produce on a regular basis? And it's got to be, you know, I would say a daunting task to do what you're doing full time and, you know, produce enough content to keep it of interest online. As uh, many of us know, it's hard to just keep up with one post a day on your social media feed or you know, maybe putting out a YouTube video once a week, but you guys seem to have this amazing amount of information. Take us through how you decide on what you're going to produce and also just some best practices for those of us who might be trying to dive into that side of the business. Yeah. So when we first started, I mean, I think Sean may have had a YouTube channel. Is that right, Sean? When we met, I had a small one. I was kicking around. I just started kicking around the idea of putting gears content on YouTube because it hadn't been done yet. So that was, I had a small channel when I first started. But I didn't have one. And so we basically started AMG from dead zero followers, zero subscribers, anything. And our, our content idea was okay, what are the things that we're interested in doing and talking about in the golf swing from an instructor's point of view? And we just figured that everybody would be interested in the same things. And that was completely backwards. Okay, so that idea of, of talking to golfers from an instructor's point of view was completely backwards. We didn't get any subscribers. We didn't get any traction doing that. And someone gave us some very good advice early. It's like, learn what the golfer wants to talk about, not what you guys want to talk about. So that kind of changed gears for us a little bit. Spent a lot of time doing uh, Google searches of what golfers were actually searching for. And that's kind of to kind of tailor our content and those ideas to that, those topics. Then we started to get, you know, a subscriber here, a subscriber there, a couple comments here. And then sh shortly after that, they'll be more than willing to share with you what they want to hear from you or what they need help with. And once we kind of got that idea, rather than talking about the things we wanted to talk about in the golf swing from our perspective, what do they want to hear? What do golfers want to hear? What do they need to know when they're teeing off on Saturday to help them hit better drives or hit fewer bad shots? Then we started to kind of snowball and started to gain some traction with our audience. Yeah, those are great insights there. And certainly, I think all of us need to think about our audience more because so much of what we're doing with our business, whether you're doing one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction, group instruction, clinics, whatever it might be, um, knowing what your customer wants and delivering that will obviously help you and your brand continue to grow. But a lot of times it's easy to get sidetracked. You know, you see so much content out there. You think, gee, I need to do a video on shallowing the club. Well, that may or may not be relative to your customer base. That mm. might not be something that means a whole lot, but for some of you and, and uh, certainly what you guys are doing, you've hit a lot of notes, I think, that are of interest. And I think it's really smart that you go about your business the way you do. Um, what's it like going from the traditional world of teaching golf out on the tee, watching the ball fly in the air every day, you know, seeing people in person, not to say you don't anymore, but it sounds like most of what you're doing is online and in an indoor setting. Uh, what's that transition been like? Do you miss being out on the tee? Take us through that if you would. Oh, you want me to start, Mike? Yeah, hit that one. Um, so I, I taught as a traditional teacher for a long time, I guess like 20 years, basically on the lesson T. And um, we, when we started building this, I was working at David Tom's Academy in, in Louisiana. And I was teaching a lot of lessons, like probably 1500 a year or so. It was a lot for me uh, to be teaching hourly lessons. And as we started growing this business, you know, we were making more money with the athletic motion golf side things. And I was in the daily lessons. So I was able to leave that and go pretty much mostly online now. And it was an adjustment period at first because uh, instead of being on the lesson tee every day, I was having to answer comments on YouTube and check on somebody's swing in the mm -hmm. Facebook group or check on somebody's swing in our elite group and give feedback that way, maybe a quick FaceTime. It felt like at first that I really wasn't uh, working hard. It, I, I felt like I wasn't working as much. It was just in a different way. And it took a little 
a little time to adjust my mind to like, no, I, this is what I need to do now to grow the business instead of standing on the lesson tee and making that one transaction. I can, I can grow the business more by focusing more on the YouTube side of things or answering questions or social media posts instead of just one-on-one lessons. So at first it felt like I wasn't really working as much. I was just working in a different way. Hopefully that comes across the right way. I don't, I don't know how Mike feels about it, but that, that was my adjustment period is like, I need to do this. It's less transactional and more growing the business as a whole. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it felt like we were we were working with more golfers for any one hour of the day rather than the one golfer at that one time slot. And it, it took an adjustment period to do that. Um, but what we found was, you know, golfers would typically come in and see us for a lesson. Say they come in tomorrow for a lesson and then come back four or six weeks later. It, it's that four to six weeks in between lessons that we weren't seeing them that really dictated or, or determined how well they would improve or not improve during those in-person times and learning how to do, to teach online in, in the more small, more frequent touches. I think now that we've gotten a few years under our belts doing that, I think has made us both better teachers and certainly our, our players are progressing faster because it's like we we tell them all the time, like, we want to see you during those four to six weeks and we can do that at five minute, you know, short touches more frequently rather than block it off an hour of time. Cause a lot of golf golfers don't need an hour of time to get what they need to work on. And it just makes for more efficient use of that time for both us and them. Well, that's great feedback on, on that transition from traditional to what you're doing now, which is, I think uh, really Working for you guys, obviously, you have a huge following, a great amount of interest in your different programs you're offering. When you do your videos, um, obviously, they're, they're at different time lengths. Uh, can mm-hmm. you talk to us a little bit about that? And, and roughly, when you decide, hey, I'm going to shoot uh, a video on this particular topic, how do you manage your time for that? What do you expect it to take and so forth? And I know that's a a tricky ask, but for those of us curious on number one, the the length of videos you'd recommend shooting and also the time to set aside to do the job. Yeah, so, and, and this has really kind of evolved as, as the years have gone along. Um, some of the early advice we got, which still holds true, is that you, you make the best content you can make. So whatever your specialty is, don't try to tease the audience with it because they're used to getting the full thing now online. Give them your best content and then make the video. So make the length of the video, make all of the graphics in there, make that for the algorithm of whatever platform you're on. For us, our big channel is YouTube. So we have to make a video for whatever that YouTube algorithm wants. And if you make the video to please the algorithm, so right now YouTube is really big on watch time. So our videos now are trending between 10, 15 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes long. If you make good content for that amount of time, YouTube will pick up on it and they will start suggesting your video. And the more suggestions you get from YouTube, like when you all log in and and click on YouTube, your videos will start to pop up more often. The more golfers will click on it and it'll start to snowball that way. When we first started, we were so uncomfortable in front of the camera, we just tried to squeeze out three minutes on any given topic which was made us feel better because we could complete a video, but YouTube wasn't rewarding that. So we did a lot of videos for a long period of time without any views, without any subscribers. Mm -hmm. And once we learned that you make the content to fit the algorithm, then the algorithm will start to reward your videos. More people will see it. And then you'll start to snowball and gather those followers and subscribers. And, and as far as the, uh, time it takes you guys to do your videos mark russo was curious as if you could just touch on that for us please uh normally when we shoot content just our regular type of youtube videos we'll get together and we'll block off one to two days to shoot the videos we may shoot sean what's the most we've shot in in one day in one day yeah back in the back in the louisiana days probably what 10 11 yeah, so we would sit down and shoot 10, 11, 15 to 20 minute videos in a day. 
at the end of that day, you're spent. You're crushed. Um, mm -hmm. Now we try to do anywhere from five to seven, uh, just because you, you just don't get nearly as mentally fatigued. That's shooting the content. We're pretty good. We do everything now in one take. We just got practice at it. Then the editing will spread out over the next several weeks and make sure that those videos are getting released on our best days for guys that watch the videos or when our audience enjoys watching videos. And then um, we'll repeat the process when those videos are done. We'll make 10 new ones and do the same thing. Now, our pros versus AMs videos can take two to three months to do. Really heavily graphics. A lot of research goes into them. So those are kind of our try to do those once every quarter, once every six months. That's a lot yeah. of work, everyone, and certainly uh, great tips there for producing content. Sean, just a quick question for you. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know you've you've uh, been coming at this from different angles. You as well, Mike. Um, has your student population changed a lot in terms of the type of players you work with from where you used to teach to now the folks you see online? Um, uh, not really, I guess. The people that want to find you and are attracted to your message is, is pretty much the same as it has been. They, a certain, a certain person seeks us out. They want the tech, they want the gears data. They like the force plates. They want the, all the information. So, and we get those golfers across the board, um, just like I used to when I was at, um, the Academy, when you came down and saw me with gears, you know, once they realize you have the tech that I feel like that attracts a certain golfer and, and we're still getting those guys um, just because kind of that's what our whole message is about. How about you, Mike? Similar? Or yeah, different? I think the only difference is, uh, you know, I can remember teaching here in Cartersville and, you know, I was excited when the guy from the next town over would come in, you know, so somebody <laughs> yeah. from Marietta would drive to Cartersville. Now it's, it's, commonplace for somebody from Taiwan to fly in to get a lesson. So our, our, the same golfers are just now reaching them all over the world. Yeah. And I'm amazed at how many, I mean, it's a testament to how many people want to get better at golf because they will come from far and away if they think they can get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great stuff there. And I think, you know, uh, we have uh, some folks that are interested in knowing your ratio of online versus in-person lessons. Um, I know, I know mostly what you're doing is your online business, but if you could touch on that, that would be great. Uh, going into, or I should say finishing 2022, we were roughly 90% of our revenue was online, 10% in-person. Uh, we would set aside one weekend, usually a long weekend, usually Friday to Sunday. Uh, for in-person lessons, one weekend a month was about all we had time for in the schedule uh, with, with all the other commitments and then for in-person lessons and then the rest of it would be online. <laughs> That's going to change this year with the new facility, which we're excited about because we can bring on more instructors now. Yeah, we're about to hire three instructors. I mean, the demand, all we need to really do is turn the switch on and, you know, we can have these people busy with lessons. We just haven't had the time for it. Well, it's interesting to see how you've grown your business and then certainly it'll be exciting when you open the doors and take it to the next level. Uh, do you guys use, Billy wants to know, um, does AMG use a specific platform app to give your lessons? How do you do your online lessons in terms of uh, producing, I guess, the, the feedback to the consumer when they send their swing at or Maybe just take us through what, what happens in an online transaction. That might be a better way to do it. So, it a, yeah, so we have a few different online lessons, I guess we would say, throughout the business. So one is, we would call it just a traditional online lesson. We, we nicknamed that an I lesson. And basically the golfer will send in um, a swing via email and we'll upload it. We've been using Swing Catalyst for that because I can do it on my, my PC, my laptop. And it will upload the video, do the, it's about an eight to 10 minute voiceover. And then we send it back to them. Um, so that, that's been easy as far as that goes for the traditional online lesson. And then um, 
another way we we provide the feedback is in our elite program it's the highest level online program we have you get basically daily access to it and uh, that's called the golf coach app and um that that's been really good because the, the golfer can just upload their swing in there we can do the voiceover inside the app send it back in there there can be text messages it's like a stream of communication like if they're in there for a year they have an entire year of the communication that we've had back and forth so um, that's for the elite program. And then the last thing we have uh, as far as online feedback is uh, we have something called AMG Plus. Uh, the, the golfer pays a monthly subscription fee of about $150 and they have access to a Facebook group where they can post their swing. And we just give uh, a written communication feedback in there. So depending on which program you're in, you have a little different way that you get your feedback. That's great. And when you look at your online business, if you thought about someone dipping their toes in the water, so to speak, maybe thinking about getting into adding this to their menu, mm -hmm. any best practices that you'd recommend out of the gates just to get going in the right direction? I would say just the Gmail, just email. You can get started and do a lot of online lessons through email. Um, a Zoom account's great if you like to actually sit there and, and watch the live shots. Um, it's always good to have that option for the player to have a follow-up after a lesson with Zoom. And then, um, you know, any of the free, we use the free online apps for a long time when we were getting started. So there's there's a several ways at really no cost that you can can do a really strong online business for, for online lessons. That's great yeah. feedback. Sorry, what do you I guys think? You no, I want to continue. To, if yeah, you I want to add more. something there. So I, I think the best way to start is just to do like we call it the eye lesson. It's just your traditional. They send in the video with good camera angles. You load it into your laptop. And when you're first starting out, this is good because you can take your time. And I always say this, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to give a bad online lesson because you have time with looking at the video to kind of get your thoughts together and look at it for a few minutes and, and make some good comments about what they need to work on. And then you can send it back to them. And that, that there, I think is the easiest way to get started as far as online lessons, you know, charge whatever you want to charge for one online lesson. You can do it at home on the weekends or something when you're watching football, sit there and knock a few of them out, make some extra money to start with. And then once that starts growing, you can start doing some of these other avenues as far as subscription services and, and things like that. Yeah, it's a it's a great way to gain experience teaching for that reason, because you don't have to give the fix right there when the guy's staring at you or the, or the girl's staring yeah. at you. You've got a couple of days to to think about what you're saying, you know, and check things out and you can do it for next to no cost to, to gain experience. So in terms of pricing, any any thoughts on how you would price if this is something new you're offering? Let's say we'll just use a round number. Let's say someone charges $100 an hour for a, a normal golf lesson. Um, mm -hmm. How would you advise them for introducing their online pricing? Should they keep it the same? Should it be different? What are your thoughts? Uh, Maybe I when you first start, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it comes down to just, just availability and, and how much time you want to spend on it. Um, our, our lessons have always been based on just availability. Like when we first started our eye lessons, I think they were $47, weren't they, Sean? Yeah. Yep. And they're up to $197 now. And it's basically the same format. We just don't have the time to do as many as we once did. And we always offer yeah. them in a package too at a little bit of a discount that always helps. That, that makes a, a good point. I mean, right now, I mean, that's part of the reason we're bringing on more people as well, but I think we have a few thousand eye lessons that we haven't even turned on yet that people are ready to go. So mm -hmm. um, if you, if you do a good job with the, with a traditional online lesson, the word will spread because that person will tell a few people and that per just like normal, you know, uh, word of mouth, and you can get busy fairly quickly and to circle it back around to the pricing, you know, let's say you start at $50 and you get pretty busy at 50 and then raise it up to 75 and raise it to hundred, just like you would and any other kind of supply versus demand situation. And pretty soon, you know, it could be a pretty good chunk of revenue for you. And it's just doing it in your off time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's very helpful, guys. Thank you. Um, Mark Russo wanted to ask, what handicap level player do you typically use as the amateur example for your pros versus AMs videos? And any big surprises that you have found in this process? Hmm. Yeah, I tell people all the time, we, we look, feel like we learn the most from those videos, just going through all the, all the information and data and, and compiling everything to make the video. Um, I would say handicap range so far, the videos we used, I think we've had a 10 handicap, maybe a 12, all the way down to scratch. So it's, it's been in that kind of, not quite teens, but in that group, which tends to be where most of the golfers that we work with kind of fall into. Golfers are just getting into the low teens or, or low double digits down to scratch golfers. Um, I don't know, Sean, what do you think is the, the biggest thing we've learned from those so far? Mm. I need to think about that one for you. I need to think about that one for a minute. What's the biggest thing we've learned? I don't know. I'm going to have to put my head around that one. That's, I caught, I'm going to we learned something what do you think? In, in every one of them. Like um, the one we're working on now and the release video, there's a few things that we didn't weren't aware of before. Um, the shallowing video, seeing all of those clubs, seeing those clubs from all those tour winners, how at the, the top they were they were pretty wide spread apart, and then every inch they got in the downswing, all those clubs just kind of converged, and uh, there wasn't a ton of outliers in that as far as how they shallow the club with just what the club does. Right. Um, I think probably the biggest overall thing that we've learned is that out of about eight to ten key parameters these great players do very similar things in those yeah. eight to 10 parameters. And I always use Sean and I as examples. We're so differently built. Uh, we can look extremely different and we are going to look extremely different doing those, those key things, but the data, it's going to look very similar in the data, despite what it looks like on, on video. Great stuff there, guys. Yes. The, uh, kinematics versus the kinetics the motion you see versus the forces that produces what we see on video uh, there's definitely a big separation there and uh, speaking of of technology um, we got a question here that um, pertains to when you have clients that aren't as tech savvy an older mm -hmm. client or someone who doesn't really know how to set up the camera angles properly uh, but they do want an online lesson. How do you help them with that? And uh, I believe that question came in from our chat from uh, Madeline Foley. Um, I think the best thing to do is create a video up front that explains the process, maybe even have it written out in a document that once they sign up and pay for the lesson, you send them the video that shows how to set the cameras up. And then also explains to them, hey, you're going to video your swing, email it to this email address, make it so it's almost dummy proof that they have it laid out in front of them step by step. And um, it seems to we haven't had too many problems. I mean, guys will send bad, bad camera and we'll just tell them, hey, I can't help you here. Go ahead and re reshoot the video. And um, usually they do a good job the second time around. That's That's been a huge learning curve for us. Uh, I think a lot of golfers just, if a camera sees it, they think it's a good enough angle. And, yeah, yeah. You know, it's something teachers we just take for granted, but the average golfer doesn't really understand the importance of that. And so I think Sean's dead on the money. Make a video that everybody can access. And it, yeah, it certainly clears up a lot of confusion. Yes, very important that they set the camera up consistently <laughs> and, and in a way where you can give them proper feedback. Um, also, with respect to technology, I know that, you know, things are different now. We're in, 2023 our phones are incredible but back in 2016 when you guys started out obviously the phones weren't what they are today uh, talk a little bit about how you started on the equipment side some of the tools that you use to produce your content and you know obviously today when you do a, a video for YouTube and just in general your videos are really high-end quality as far as the look and feel Tell us a little bit about the equipment you use and 
the editing software and some of the tricks that uh, come into play to make your content look so professional. And um, if, if time permits, maybe just some do's and don'ts on that as well. Thank you. Yeah, so the equipment, I mean, phones are fantastic now like you said like that's the best piece of technology that everybody's got in their pocket that they can use um what we learned the hard all these lessons have been hard lessons that we've learned what we learned from the get-go was we spent all of like if we would make a nickel we would put it back in the business and usually to buy some sort of tech in our case you know was buy cameras to film videos with and but we didn't spend any money on microphones and golfers and audience in general, because I think this applies to not just golf, but other areas, is people will watch a bad video. Maybe if it's a little blurry or it pops in and out of focus, if the audio is good. If the audio is bad and the video looks awesome, they're going to tune out as soon as they start watching. Um, and, and we've had, uh, that's always was a hard uh, lesson to learn because we spent so much time on the visual part of it because we thought that was the important part and we had really bad microphones or no microphones at all. And they would get zero views. We would make the same video six months later and it would do gangbusters just because we had better microphones at the time. So that's certainly worth the investment. And there's a lot of really good inexpensive microphones out now that they're wanting back then. Um, editing wise, I mean, watch YouTube videos. That's how I've learned to edit our videos by watching YouTube videos. It doesn't take a lot of software now. I think now you can edit just about everything on an iPad, uh, which most of us probably use in our in our business. So iPad, a laptop, um, and then you can go however much time you want to spend from there. You can get as fancy as you want, but just some basic editing software, Final Cut Pro, Motion. Um, What's the other one that comes with uh, Macs? And I think uh, Windows has one included as well. Like this stuff's all pretty much free now, I think. And you can do bang up jobs and videos by just watching YouTube videos on how to edit, you know, where to put the cuts, how to use the, the kind of optimize the audio. And, you know, you spend a couple hours a night for a week and you'll have a pretty good understanding of how to, how to edit a video. Then it's just practice and know that when you start making videos, they're going to be bad. I mean, we've got, we've got so many bad videos that no one will ever see, <laughs> but that's, you know, if you think a video is great, you edit a video and put out a video tomorrow and you think it's just the great, it's the best video you ever made six months from now, you'll think that video is terrible because you're yeah. just yeah. like your golfers, your, your skill progression will get better. But the key is just to get started. I mean, everybody's videos are bad, but even the worst video, if it's good information is going to help somebody. And that first golfer you help online will be a fan for life. Mm -hmm. That's great advice there. In terms of microphones, uh, what do you mm -hmm. like for doing your videos? Which Gosh, we've wasted uh, so much money over the years in microphones. Um, what do we got now? Squid mics? What are those things we called? Use, we use squids now. So the, the lavalier mics that we started using were Sennheisers, which were they, they still pretty much are the industry standard, but if you don't have um, someone monitoring them, you can do, and this happened to us, our, our <laughs> first uh, our first uh, series that we shot, it was, uh, you know, how to pick up um, ball speed. We shot the whole thing, went to a golf course, drove about an hour away. The golf course was real kind, let us film there, came back and started listening to the footage and you couldn't hear any of it. It was just all static. So we had to go out and buy a different microphone. Uh, if you're using one mic, it's usually not an issue. If you're having two people on, there's going to be a lot of cross interference. So for that reason, we use uh, Tinnacle right now, which it records it directly into the to the uh, device. And we haven't had any issues at all with those. Rode makes very similar products that are really good. Um, I can't think of the other one, but there's about three or four You'll see them all the time on YouTube that like have a little black box usually connected to the shirt somewhere. Those microphones are great and they're pretty inexpensive and they're all pretty much foolproof. That's the main thing when you're when you're shooting your own content. You don't want to spend two days shooting and then come back and figure out you got to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's great advice. I was also curious when you shoot your videos, obviously we have different platforms, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook, you have different formats that are better for a particular platform. How do you go about it? And it might be a redundant question, but do you, you have one camera for one format and another camera for the other format? Or what do you do to make sure that you're videos can be used on multiple platforms efficiently? That's a great question. I'm glad I meant to throw this in earlier. Um, this is a super important question. We make all of our content for long form videos. We make all of our content for YouTube and we'll film everything in 4K. Some of the stuff we're filming in 8K now, just because it gives us the ability to crop to different formats. We can make a 4K video, crop it for perfect format for uh, Instagram or Facebook, you know, in the, in the vertical format. Um, but if you make, if you start off making long form videos, you've got weeks of short form content from a 15 minute video, 30 second clip here, you know, a 10 second mm -hmm. image here. And it really allows you to maximize the time you spend making content. If you, Sean's been really good actually about making individual content for uh, Instagram but if you solely rely on Instagram content, then go shoot YouTube content, you'll wind up just being a full-time uh, videographer filming yourself and you won't get to spend as much time as you need to on the business. So that long form content is really where everything comes from for us. Yeah, that, that's a nice hack to be able to shoot one video and you've got content for months, basically. Um, mm -hmm. If you cut it up and you can use it for all the different formats. And then, you know, I, the more I do it, I try to play around with like the Instagram videos, uh, trying to come up with different ways to keep people interested. And I'll, I'll set aside one day a week and shoot maybe five or 10 of them and just test out different ideas that you see. You might see a video that you saw from another golf instructor that you thought was a cool idea and you might tweak it and make it your own a little bit and different music on the background. I'm always trying to test things out to see, um, kind of what catches and once in a while you'll get one that gets randomly gets 200,000 views and, and sometimes it's not even one that you would think would get that many views you might have thought it wasn't even one of your better videos but like we said in the beginning it's like it's more up to the golf golfer to decide what, what they want to see excellent information there and I, I think everybody you know these guys and and we have the chat open I'm gonna ask them some questions from the chat that have just come in but if, you, if there's anything that you can think of that you want to ask them, please add it to the chat here. Um, I'm going to just scroll back here a second um, just to take Tom Harris's question. And his question is, now that you can use platforms that show 3D data, are you using these platforms for your online lessons? Not um, quite yet. No. Go ahead, Mike. No, we, we, we haven't found, um, and this is literally feels like it's changing by the month. Those, those options are becoming more and more common and better. But we haven't found a markerless 3D system yet that, was, that we're comfortable enough with its accuracy. And talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind, because I think a lot of folks are seeing this opportunity now to go to, and I'm not going to use any company names, but mm -hmm. a 3D solution where they're just going to take their phone mm -hmm. and from one camera angle, they're going to come up with a 3D motion assessment mm -hmm. of a player. You know, talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about when you measure in 3D, some of the key measurements you're looking for and how they would have to be measured and where that might be a problem with some of these systems that are coming out. And, and not to say you can't help people with them, but sure, sure. You know, if you're going to put your name on it, you guys are branded as being, you know, obviously accuracy. folks that use the best mm -hmm. technology, accuracy, et cetera. Talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, so we've been approached for a few years now uh, with, with different companies most of them you have probably not heard of. I don't think they've actually come to market yet for that reason. Like doing a golf swing with one camera view is just, you, the camera just doesn't see the whole golf swing. 
So there's a lot of algorithmic um, calculations that are made. And whenever we've tested those systems up to a full-fledged 3D system, like Gears, for instance, what we currently use, you know, eight cameras, what, 34 markers, um, it just misses a lot. And, or I should say it tries to fill in the gaps a lot. And the closest I think we've seen is a three camera system gets, you know, is still not going to be as accurate, but it gets closer. And obviously when you have four cameras, five cameras, then you're, mm -hmm. you're getting now where the cameras are actually, actually seeing all, the entire golf swing. I think in a nutshell, that's what it boils down to is, you know, one camera can only see one view. So you're asking the, the algorithm to fill in a lot of the blanks. And when we've tested that, against 3d it's some of them it's good some of it's really far off and then you get everything in between and we just haven't found a consistent um miss yet so if you know if if you one camera 3d someone and you know the hip angle was 10 degrees different every time well you know you can work with that but if mm -hmm. it's two degrees different and then 14 degrees different we've seen it as much as 32 degrees different then you know, where do you kind of fill in the gap? So it really depends on, as a teacher, what are you looking to get out of that system? And, and then it's understanding its limitations. And, you know, with all this, all the tech software, whether it's track man, gears, whatever, it's all has limitations and it's knowing those limitations and then what you're comfortable enough, you know, working okay. for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, it's the way everything's going. And I have no doubt we're going to be all using markerless sooner rather than later. In terms of the current single camera markerless systems, what would be like a giant hole while we're talking about it where you can't accurately see what you need to see with that single camera view? Where would it be? Where would you call BS on that? If you don't mind me asking. From the, from the, the actual swings that we've had both runnings, we've had the single camera on a tripod, dead still, perfect case scenario, in conjunction with 3D. It was all over the board, to be honest. I don't think we've seen a parameter yet that we're like, okay, that's really close. Yeah, it was just kind of all over the board. Obviously, rotation would be a hard thing to see, but it was really right. all over the, the board. Yeah. With what we saw as far as accuracy, we put it, we put them up against gears and um, we, we, we couldn't get a, a consistent miss. Like Mike said, I was hoping to see, okay, this is this, this is off the same every time. And mm -hmm. it just wasn't, it was a little bit all over the board. So we, we put it on the bench for now until we feel like we're comfortable with, with using something like that. That's great information for everyone. I think we all need to be aware of what we're, capturing what it means and and avoid getting yourselves in a situation where you're saying this is happening and you know one of your players goes down the road and gets measured on a 3d system that conflicts with your system because that will right. discredit what you're doing and you know we want to help the player in front of you and make sure you're not missing it i think some of these systems they create a really nice visual for mm -hmm. for the player and and they can add some eye candy to the experience but be careful with uh, stuff that isn't measuring consistently, I think, is the message here. And right. when you have it, you'll embrace it. I'd like anything else in technology. Once you find something that works well, you're going for it. And uh, we do have another question for you from our chat. Justin Myers is um, curious about your pre-planning in terms of when you do your content creation. Do you create shot lists, voiceovers, speaking points, and then um, I think, you know, obviously we talked up about some of this earlier on, but anything in there that you want to add to what you mentioned before? Yeah, so how it works now is we, we're, we're fortunate to have, to have um, made videos consistently long enough to where we actually started. And that's kind of the goal for this is when you first start out, you want to make consistent videos for the format. Every format, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, loves consistency. So if you decide you want to do it, just be consistent with it. Then you'll start to gain a big enough following. Then once you have a big enough following, then you will attract people who do that for a living as far as like know the algorithms that can really let you do what you do best and not worry about all the, the behind the scenes type stuff. 
So the guy that we were able to hire and the team that we were able to hire does what we ask for them for our YouTube videos now is give us a list of 35 of the most searched for um, golf, golf topics topic. last month. Mm -hmm. Like, so what, what are golfers looking for in instruction? Do they want to stop coming over to the top? Is it weight shift? Whatever that is for that last month, they'll give us those 35 topics. Then Sean and I will pick 10 out of there. And then that's our 10 videos we're going to shoot for the day. Most of those will have some, maybe a voiceover for gears. So how that'll work is we'll shoot the, the in-person content. I'll come pull a few gears images out just to kind of really drive the point home. And then I'll maybe write two or three paragraphs for each image and then just record a voiceover for that. And that seems to be right now the winning formula for our videos and what our audience likes to see. But it, it's a little bit of both. And then the, the pros versus aims videos, it is uh, much more scripted because there's so much more numbers involved with it that we have to make sure we're, you know, especially the way I speak, I'll get numbers and words backwards all the time. So I like to write it out. Then I'll have an idea what I'm talking about. Then I'll match the images with what I'm saying. That's great advice. And I think everyone can benefit from that. And, you know, it's, we all have these ideas on how we want to put content together and, putting them on a whiteboard or a piece of paper would go a long mm -hmm. way to keeping you uh, in, in your process on track. And, you know, the, the microphone I would say is such a big piece of it. I know what you brought up is definitely a sticking point for so many. And, yeah. you know, you want to test your audio. Um, how about camera locations? Gregory Smith wants to know where you like to put the camera in terms of the down the line position and, also the height of the camera, if you could talk about that. For shooting videos or for the golf swing? Well, his question is optimal camera locations. I'm assuming it's he's looking at the golf swing, not okay. necessarily shooting a, a content video, but we'll take we'll take your answer to that as well. Sean, you want to do the vid you want to do the golf swing part? I'll do the video yeah, part. Go golf swing. We we try to keep it super simple, just uh, the down the line, kind of through the hands toward the target. And then uh, the face on just kind of belt high 90 degrees to where the golfers aimed. And uh, if you can get them to do that, that, that keeps it pretty consistent. And we got that from uh, Scott Hamilton and we spent, he's like a mentor to us. We spent so much time with, and then, you know, he got it from the old school days. And then once we got gears, that actually is the closest match to the gears Fine. parallax free view of the golf swing so it it, it wind up being, i wish we could say we we invented that but we didn't um and it just gives us the most accurate view relative to what you would see in a parallax free distortion free golf swing from gears um that's very helpful and then video wise you just, yeah you just want to shoot kind of chest high is kind of the standard there so it doesn't make you like if we film and i have the camera too low it makes me look more like the Michelin man than I already am. Um, so it'll really distort you, especially if you're using a wide lens. And uh, wish, you know, and then if you put the camera too high, it makes you look kind of shorter and smaller. So we try to find the, the middle range, which is usually around Sean's kind of shoulder line for us is where we put videos. That's very helpful. And so as uh, we, we get down to the wire here, we've got a few minutes left and uh, we've covered a lot of different topics with the on online business. If you were to look out, what do you see coming down the pipeline? Uh, something we're already starting to kind of create a strategy for is AI. I think um, a lot of what we consider, what all of us probably consider our own proprietary information, I think is going to be gobbled up by the AI sooner, probably rather than later. So that's one of the catalysts for us having an indoor facility like we're like we're finishing up now, just uh, to kind of cover our bases. I think it's a, it's a useful tool. Uh, I don't think it's anywhere near what it's going to be like in the next two to three years. So we're, we're trying to work out a way to to make it useful for what we do. Yeah, I think and you're going to start seeing more. Sorry, Burn. 
more and more no, no, indoor locations so. pop up. They're mm -hmm. going to be everywhere. And when you guys talk about these indoor locations and the use of AI, could you just give us a few examples just to paint the picture? Yeah, so um, indoor is going to be a big deal for us and not just us. I mean, we're, we're not like we're the first ones doing it. Um, far from it. As golfers are used to everything else in their life is almost on demand, right? I don't, I don't even have a, a TV subscription anymore. I use it. I use YouTube TV or I use Netflix and it's, it's what, watch what you want when you want. And if I can just drive down the road and if I want to practice for an hour at a, at a track man simulator where I don't have to pay for other than just a small monthly fee, I would certainly do that over going out and standing beating balls on a range outside. Uh, especially depending on the climate and you know during this time of year it's just that outside golf is just not in the cards for a lot of golfers so there's that aspect of it and then the ai aspect of that is okay if you go in check into your simulator to practice for an hour what can we have that would assist you in what you're looking on so maybe you wow. film a screen you feed that into a, an app that we have and based on what that AI sees you doing in those swings, we'll recommend maybe a handful of drills or, or recommend this series of lessons on that particular issue. So there's a, there's a way to, I mean, it, it, it's hard to talk about the AI stuff without it being a little creepy because you're, you're, you're almost kind of replicating a lot of the human interaction to some extent, but if it can, if it can introduce more golfers to the right information sooner, I think mm -hmm. it's quite useful. Absolutely. That's great insights. And we do have a question from Kelly that wants to know your thoughts on artificial turf versus grass. I'm assuming this relates to teaching on it or mm -hmm. getting data in either situation. John, you're sitting on artificial turf right now. Yeah, I mean, I've been... I got my first teaching bay in 2013 uh, when I taught for David Toms at his academy. And I was only grass before that for the, you know, 10 years before that or so. And um, I mean, it hasn't really been any issue for me that the turf we use now, these real field mats. I mean, if you hit a, you hit a fat shot, you know, it's fat. And uh, if you hit a solid shot compressed, you know, it's compressed. And I haven't seen that much of a difference when they go outside. If they're hitting it good in here and putting up good numbers and hitting the ball the way I want to, I haven't seen a whole lot of difference. I haven't had anybody complain that, you know, oh, I was hitting it so good in there and now I'm not. Um, I would see that the case if it was like a really bad mat or something, but the stuff we use is, or I haven't seen any issue as far as the back and forth between grass and turf. Yeah, uh, there's no question. I mean, I think everybody would rather hit off of artificial turf. I mean, excuse me, real turf, but knowing what the difference is in like launch monitors will read for spin and, and a couple of those things. I mean, other than that. We have Hall of Famers, tour players, major winners. And they, they're just used to doing it now. I think it's just kind of part of where the game's gone because yeah. of what you gain from practicing on artificial turf. Yeah, it's nice to have one area to capture and yeah. look mm -hmm. at things and, and go back to that same area, whether you're, you know, somebody who's playing great golf, great. Mm -hmm. Let me get in there, measure what I'm doing, because at some point when they're not playing great golf, they can go back and compare or – vice versa they're playing terrible see what's going on and the good news is the turf these days has gotten way better way yep. way better much easier on your hands and wrists and lots yep. of good products out there but people do react a little different sometimes when they mm -hmm. see a tighter lie or we'll just say they're into the grain or whatever it might be so you will get some differences well this has been a great discussion um, really appreciate you guys taking the time to join us here in the Mid-Atlantic PGA. Mark and Sean, if um, you'd like to chime in with anything to close out here, I think we covered a lot of ground. Yeah, And thanks, we can't Bernie. thank you enough for being here. Yeah, thank you for hosting it, Bernie. Uh, Sean and Mike, thank you guys very much. Uh, this is one we've been looking forward to. Uh, hopefully we can get you guys uh, up into our section, do some education in person. We'd love to do that with you guys. Yeah. Uh, just real, real quick uh, for everybody before we let Sean and Mike go, just a reminder, we have one more tomorrow at one with uh, Gavin from ShotScope. Uh, he's going to be covering uh, their product, but also some of their findings and their data gathering that I think is going to be really uh, 
interesting for a lot of people to check out. So please make sure you join us for that. You can sign up on MEPGA.com and uh, Christine will get you the link. Uh, so we look forward to seeing everybody on there. Um, other than that, again, Sean and Mike, thank you guys so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you guys for thank having you. us. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you, Appreciate Bernie. you having us. You're welcome. Great to Thanks, be with Phil. everyone. All right, everybody. Have a great rest of your uh, Monday, and we'll see. Uh, hopefully see a lot of you tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Thanks so much. Bernie, thanks again, man. You're very welcome.